Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Pandemic Interviews. Today I have the great pleasure of talking with Maestro Ramon Martinez. Maestro Martinez, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. So thanks for joining us today, Maestro Martinez. You're welcome, I'm happy to be here. I've been very excited about talking to you. I've known you for a long time and it's great to be able to have you on the Pandemic Interviews. Yeah, it's too bad it's such a sad occasion. I mean, an intense situation, I would say, because uh, we, we uh, have known each other for a long time, but we hardly ever get to talk because we're both so busy running around. Yes, so at least we can get some good out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to jump into the questions because I've got a lot of them for you. Sure. <laughs> when did you start studying martial arts? Well... I started studying fencing when I was, uh, I had just turned 19. I was in my s freshman year in college. And one of the, elect uh, I was a speech and drama major at the time. And one of the elective classes was a, uh, a fencing class, which I've always wanted to do. So I, I was the first guy to sign up for that class. And my, uh, my, uh, fence my first fencing teacher was, uh, a phys ed teacher, her name was um, uh, Mrs. Skinner. I don't remember her first name, but she was very nice. And uh, when I started the, the class, I remember I had a real knack for it. And, uh, uh, I, and I, was, I was pretty good. So she suggested that, you know, I should really study this because she, she, she thought that I could uh, take it pretty far. And uh, as you can see, she was right. <laughs> she could see the future. Yeah, originally I, I wanted to be an actor, and so that was that was one of the electives in the in, in the program that I was there. Okay. So then, with, to me, it was this, 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 I just had that chance. I was about to do it. You know, growing up as a kid, I used to watch Zorro on television all the time. Oh, the old Walt Disney series with, with Guy Willens, and I always said to myself, I can do that, and, and maybe one day I can do it better than him. <laughs> and look what happened. There you go. Yeah. So you mentioned that. Uh, the style of, or you mentioned the movie and the TV show Zorro. What style do you think Zorro would have used as a sword fighter? I mean, aside from the, for, or if, it were, if, if that was a, a reality, of yes. how, if Zorro was real, he would use uh, La Verdadera Destreza because he was, you know, a, a highly skilled swordsman. So then, uh, because we do have documentation that there was that 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 character is based on a real person, and if that was real, so then we would have had what you're teaching being used combatively here in California. Yeah, and as the Zorro uh, that Macaulay wrote about, he was the author of, of, of the Zorro. He was he was based on a bandit. Yes. Uh, but the character was not a bandit. He was a no, he, he was a, he was a, a, a gentleman, you know, somebody that's well educated, well connected from a high ranking family. So the fact that he was sent to Spain to study, I it, it would stand to reason that he would have learned the verdadera destreza because he would have sought out the, the finest masters in the world, and they were right there in Spain, wherever he was. Because we're never really quite sure where he trained in Spain. Some people think Madrid, according to Zorro lore, we don't really know. Okay. At least I don't remember. That's cool. That's cool to be able to tie history and fiction and modern day and what you and I do. It's, it's so cool mm -hmm. to be able to bring it all together. Now, the the weapon that uh, that Zorro uses on the on the television show that's that's just a a, a modern uh, saber hilt with mounted with an epee blade, which is completely inaccurate. Uh, and the same thing with the uh, with the old Tyrant Power movie that was a an Italian hilt mounted with a with a with a French epee blade. The one Douglas Fairbanks used that weapon was built by Rhodes, by the way. Uh, and they're mounted with a Schlager blade. With this sort of Italianesque hilt, which I don't think is historically accurate at all. What kind of blade would Zorro have used? Well, if if, if Zorro was a real person, he would he would probably have used a rapier blade, a, a type of rapier, because 
the Spanish system, the, the stresa was applied to many different weapons. It was applied to, to saber, it was applied to rifle and bayonet, it was applied to the lance, it was applied to many different things, to the espadín, which is the Spanish version of the small sword, but, uh, and the, uh, the cup hill rapier. But I am, I am if, if you ask me, he would have been carrying, if Zorro was a real person, he would have most likely have been carrying a cup hill rapier with a diamond cross section blade, a hexagonal forte. And uh, very sharp and very pointed. Cool, cool. Have you studied other martial arts styles? Yes, I had. I had when I was uh, in my late twenties. I studied several Asian martial arts. Uh, I studied uh, uh, Northern Eagle Claw Kung Fu for a very short time, and I tried different. Uh, when I was in college, uh, many of my friends were, were black belts in this in, uh, in different styles of Japanese. Japanese martial arts, so I tried Goju-ryu, Karate, which I didn't like, uh, and a couple of other systems like Taekwondo and things like that, which I didn't really like. But uh, I tried those already when I was already fencing uh, uh, during college, because after my first year in college, I, I, there was no advanced courses in fencing, so, you know, uh, I, uh, my sophomore, before the beginning of my sophomore year, I was working in a liquor store on um, in, in Manhattan, on, uh, right by Lexington Avenue in the 80s. And uh, uh, was on 84th Street, so on my lunch hour, I was walking around and I saw a theater, it was the Lowe's Orpheum Theater, and above that theater, there was a, uh, a sign that says, Fencing Academy, Rose Fencing Academy. So, you know, I, I walked around there for a couple of days on my lunch hour. I used to go to a place called Papaya King, which is right, almost right next door to it. So one day on my lunch hour, I decided to just walk up and see what's up. So I, I knocked on the door. It was on the top floor. There's no elevator. You had to climb up the stairway. And this old man opened up. And he, he was wearing a, a, a dirty, greasy apron. And he was working on fixing, I don't know what. So he, he uh, and he spoke with a very strange accent. He told me to come in. And uh, the, and when I walked into that place, it looked like I had stepped back in time. And it was, it was then he took me into the, into the cell, which was the training room. And he shows me a Schlager. What's, he, uh, what's that? A Schlager is, is the type of weapon that they use in the German Minster where they get the scar with the Schmiss. Uh, uh, and the, uh, um, it's a double-edged diamond cross-section blade with no point, but it's very sharp. And it has a big basket hilt on it. On my, on my website, there is a picture of Maestro Rose holding it. And uh, okay. he showed me, he handed me that. He said, do you know what that is? And I said, I have no idea what that is. He said, well, that's why you have to come here to find out what that is. <laughs> but he never told me who he was. I just thought he was a crazy old man. Said, I, when, I, when I come back, I'll, I'll meet the master and, and then... Uh, We'll see, we'll see what's up. Little did you That's, know. Uh, little did I know. Yeah. So uh, I walked in there. I came in like a, 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 the following day. And who opens the door? That same old man. He's dressed in black. He's got his white wax, wax mustache. He's got his hair long. He looked like, uh, he looked a lot like Arthur Fiedler. Uh, former conductor of the Boston Pops, but uh, he, this was Arthur Feeder with, with a real attitude that could fill an entire room. And that's <laughs> how the whole thing got started. I, I had intended to be there only from June to August because I just wanted to get enough training because I, you know, to, to go back to school. And uh, 10 years later, I was still there. Now, we hear the term all the time, uh, Swordmaster when we're dealing mm -hmm. with schools or with videos. Uh, but he was a master of arms. Are they the same thing? No, they're not, they're not the same. But the term of so master, master of arms, uh, maestro de arm in French, maestro de esgrima in Spanish, maestro de esquerma uh, in Italian, fechtmeister, which means fet, a fencing master in German, uh, that those, those are the actual terms. The, the term swordmaster is a recent date, and that came out of you know, the uh, uh, the movie and, and uh, the entertainment industry because they used to put 
on the, on the credits on the movies, uh, Marvel Sword Masters. There's no such thing really as a sword master, right? Because if a person was a teacher of fencing, right, or or swordsmanship, he would be called an instructor, not a sword master. Uh, fencing or a fencing master or master master of arm master uh, of arms that would be the right title. But that's I think that's that's a twentieth century. Uh, 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 term that that popped up out of the entertainment business and there's nothing wrong with that but it's not a historical term this brings up something that i hadn't thought about recently uh but i remember talking to you several years ago about the original choreographers of hollywood mm -hmm. were fencing masters mm -hmm. when did that change and why that's a it's an interesting question because it's, it's it's an interesting phenomenon because back back in the day in, in, the, in the era of the silent movies when the movies first got started and, and all through through the through the 30s 40s 50s even up into the 60s what they would do was they would hire a fencing master who was well who was had some knowledge of the historical weapons to choreograph whatever uh, sword fights or duels um and the actors were the, the better actors all, were already trained in fencing. Not all of them, but a lot of them were. Uh, a friend of mine who used to work for 20th Century Fox back in uh, he's, up, he's on the contract uh, to 20th Century Fox back in the 1940s. He said that in the studio system, you you would have to report to work every day, whether or not you were making a movie. And at that time, you were trained in different things. You were trained how to sing how to dance how to ride a horse how to box how to fence and you, and you would train every day so these actors were trained now were they olympic or, or you know you know you know first rate fences no so the only one i know that was uh that i had i know almost unanimously all the all the, uh, all the people that worked back in the air said it was a battle wrath but anyway that continued right and then what happened is that they they this this, this whole idea of fight director st got started uh, I, I'm not sure when. I think in the back it was in the '70s, and they had these, these different societies decided for fight, fight, uh, fight uh, directors here, society, the British one, uh, and, and things like that. In France, they taught is what they called esgrima ancienne at the time. They called it a, a, a historical fencing, which uh, is, was a lot different than what today they do. They call it esgrim uh, artistique, which is a whole different thing. But anyway, those fencing masters. In the movie era, in the movie uh, uh, that movie era, uh, trained these these uh, these these fencers, uh, these uh, uh, actors how to fence. But they also used a lot of doubles. Also, I know uh, my own fencing master was an assistant at the time with uh, in the 1920s with Douglas Fairbanks Sr. and he was involved in several movies and helping out to train uh, and choreograph some of the fights. And he was a uh, uh, an extra in, in, in several of them. Okay. So the, the whole idea of of movie fencing is a different discipline because there's 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 fencing, uh, and and then there's stage fencing, which later evolved into stage combat, right? And so on and so forth. You have Olympic fencing, you know, stage fencing, uh, classical fencing, historical fencing, and, and such. So they're all sort of spokes off the same base. Um, you can you can loosely say that you know it's it's it, they're they're all really separate entities because they all have different different goals in mind. Uh, uh, for instance, if you talk about um, again going back to the to to to, to stage fencing, the, the art is to create the illusion of a deadly encounter. Now uh, they have these period pieces, but in a lot of these period pieces that they do, the the, the techniques are not in fact. Uh, historically accurate at all, and the weapons are not historically accurate. Uh, but that's a whole other discussion for, for a different day. Wait, you're saying that in 18th century France, you didn't have somebody fighting with a katana versus a small sword? No, no. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> they did have small swords, but uh, for instance, I didn't mention small sword. You have a movie like, for instance, Scaramouche. They, they, these guys are slashing with the small swords all, all over the place. That weapon, that weapon was not meant to be used that way. That was a thrusting weapon. Yeah. Sure, it may it may have been sharp, but to slash the way these guys did, you know, they're using it like a saber. So that's it. that's historically inaccurate right there. But for the time period, the 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 piece of the time period of that movie, 
the use of the small sword was correct. It's how they used it that was wrong. Right, right. Yeah. Um, when we start talking about weapons uh, and styles, you teach Spanish rapier and Italian rapier. What's the difference between Spanish and Italian rapier? Well, let me clarify something first. Style. It's not a style. There's schools of fencing. Schools of fencing are, 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 are developed within the nation which that it evolved. A style of fencing is what you do. You have a style of your own. You don't fence in a style. You fence in a system. You fence in a school. A school of fencing. But the, 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 I, hear, I hear this all. What style do you fence? I said, I fence Martinez style because it's me. But if you ask me what school of fencing do you, do you fence, I will say French, Italian, French, and so okay. forth. But uh, the, the Italian school... I, I'm not going to go too back, uh, back too far in history. Uh, it it developed what, what we call today um, the side sword, which in fact was what the original form of the rapier was a cut and thrust weapon. It was double edged, and it was not as heavy as people think. Um, and it, it evolved from that. In the beginning, fencing was linear, circular, and all that. But as the, as the the Italian school developed, the weapon became longer. It became somewhat lighter, and it became a completely thrusting uh, system, but still capable of inflicting wounds with both with both edges. And they used uh, auxiliary weapons like the dagger or the cape, or the uh, sometimes even a second rapier in their hand, or, or a, um, a a buckler. Which, by the way, the buckler we have evidence that, that the, the rapier and buckler was taught all the way, or rapier and target, which is the shield, was taught all the way through the 18th century. There's, there's evidence of that. Wow. So the, the, I would say the Italian school, let's talk about, uh, take it from the 17th century, the, the, the way, the manner of fencing is linear. They become more linear. The Spanish school is all circular. The Italian school is, is based on, on uh, like all schools of fencing, it's based on time, distance, and proportion, you know, control, the weapon control, distance control, and such and such. But the, 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 main, uh, the, way, the main way of fighting was linear. If you look at treatises like Capofero, uh, Alfieri, and, and some of the other ones, they're all linear. Right? The, and the techniques were preset. We had, we had a technique, and you had a counter technique, and you had a counter, counter technique, and, uh, and that's the way you would train. And I'm being very general because to, to be specific will take it forever. The Spanish school is not, uh, is, um, let, me, let me take a step back. The Italian school has actually been around longer than the Spanish school. No. The Spanish school that we think of today is La Verdadera Destreza, which was in fact uh, put together by Don Jeronimo de Carranza, who was a, 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 a surgeon from Seville. And what he did was he looked at all the different systems of fencing, at the, of, of swordsmanship at the time, and he decided that there has to be a more scientific approach to fencing. So he did a recapitulation of all the things that that that, uh, that were around back in the day, and he uh, uh, he had science and philosophy to it. The, to, uh, the science being geometry, the uh, geometry in the in the philosophy, which was again too lengthy to get into, but it's based on movement and spatial relationships and knowledge of where you are. So instead of having preset techniques, you learn basic. Um, uh, movements to, uh, with, with the weapon and you create the technique at the time based on your knowledge of that and the specific footwork which is pretty intricate so you create the technique at the time of need based on that and for, for more in-depth um, discussion of that I would suggest for people to go to my website and read uh, uh, several articles that I've written they're called the demystification of the Spanish school Okay, and uh, that's what I've always thought to do since I started working with, but to demystify because, uh, unfortunately, the the school has been uh, basically so immersed in all this speculation and and, uh, and things talking about things like magic circles and all kinds of stuff, which never really existed. And by the way, Caranza wrote his first treatise on that. Now, the treatise was not really on fencing. He, he wrote the treatise and the title, as I can really loosely interpret it, said, the, the Art and Science of Christian Offense and Defense. Oh, really? So that, that, was, that was a whole, that was, it wasn't 
uh, he wrote that book, which, by the way, he didn't want to write. He was ordered to write that book. He got a suggestion. A suggestion from the from <laughs> a, from the Duke de Medina Sidonia, who was the one who, su who suggested that, and uh, he and he wrote it, and uh, it was I think 1569. It wasn't in general uh, uh, print until the 1580s. Um, okay. So and then you know you had one master after another, basically, and all 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 the stress of it, which means skill. Is based on on the teachings of Carranza. There was a divergence in the mid 17th century where you had the, the followers of Carranza and the followers of uh, Don, Don Luis Pacheco de Narvaez, which uh, they had they had uh, divergent political views. Let me put it that way. But when when you uh, to make a long story short, they were arguing about nothing because they were all teaching the same thing. Okay. The, 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 the different the, each master had his own approach to teaching that 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 art. Yeah, yeah, and, and that art continued for a long time. Sounds sounds like things haven't changed much in the five hundred years since then. Unfortunately, I, I think uh, humanity is pretty hard headed, <laughs> and, and, and they don't learn. So you teach Italian rapier, Spanish rapier, mm -hmm. but you also teach French small sword. Yes. How does French small sword? fit in with Italian and Spanish rapier? Well, the, the small sword, the French small sword actually uh, it be, it, it emerged in the, about the mid 17th century and it came out of the Italian school. Without the Italian school, the small, French small sword couldn't exist. Okay. Until, until finally the, the French had their, they had their own approaches to it. And it was pretty unified in its, in its, in its, de its development in history. Not so much in Italy. In, in Italy, you had different systems of, of fencing from the, the north to the middle to the south. You had Neapolitan, you had Milanese, you had, you know, Roman, you had uh, Bolognese, you had Sicilian, and, and so on and so forth. They all had different, different ideas of what fencing was like. And this continued into, almost until the present day. Do you teach the, the rapier, the small sword? Do you teach other weapons as well? I teach cane self-defense. I do that. And on occasion, I teach Bowie knife. Cool. But I, I usually only teach that on request uh, and, uh, and, uh, from my students. I have rarely taught that outside my own circle. All right. Uh, we also teach French poniard, which is, that's, 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 that's standard. We do teach that. And we have our own traditional system of, of, of rapier and rapier and and such that we inherited from Meister Rhodes, who learned it from his Meister before him and, and before that. So uh, I, before I even started looking at the Spanish and Italian rapier, I already knew a system of rapier that I had, I had learned right, right, from, right from the source. From your maestro. So it, yeah, from my maestro. And he did teach me some techniques with the small sword, but the small sword uh, is, is basically French. And he used to say to me a lot, he said, if you know real classical French foil, uh, you, have this, uh, you have the foundation for small sword. But he said, when he said, know it, he doesn't mean just know it. You have to basically own it. You have right. to be very, you have to completely internalize it. Then it's, it, it, it will, it's easier to, to, uh, to learn small sword. Now, do you have to do it that way? No, but that's the, that is back the best way. Okay. And that, that actually segues really well. And how is classical fencing different from the fencing that we see today? Okay. Classical fencing has been around for a long time. Uh, it's not a, a modern construct like some people think they evolved some, sometime in the 80s or 90s, something like that. Uh, the, just the, 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 the weight of evidence completely squashes that notion. Uh, classical fencing is the study of, of fencing or swordsmanship primarily in the dueling tradition, not a sport tradition, where form and function go together because the form evolved over centuries to create the most perfect function. The form is not there to look pretty. The, for, the form that you, that you learn is there to make you efficient. Okay. And the idea is to be able to survive a duel because you, my fencing master said, you don't win a duel, you survive it. 
because <laughs> right. the very fact that you had to go down that road, something went horribly wrong. Yeah. Uh, so uh, do, I'm not in favor of doing it. I'll say that right now. Am I capable of doing it? Yes, I am capable of doing it, but I'd rather not. Thank you very much. And I don't, and I don't recommend that to anybody because you don't want to go, you don't want to go down that road because once you step on that road, there is no coming back. Nothing good's going to come of you. There's a so, movie uh-huh. with uh, By the Sword, I think. Oh, yeah. Eric Roberts. And he does that. He's a fencing instructor in New York who is fascinated with the duel and then finds out that that's a bad path to go down. Yep. Yep. I, I've spoken to a couple of people that have been in duels and it's, um, their, and rep, their memories of it are not fond. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, so that's, that's a subject that I think this should be avoided. Now, People will say to me, well, then what's the point of studying classical fencing? Because you're not going to be in a duel. And I think the matter is this. You study classical fencing because you want to learn a real martial art. And your, 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 most, your biggest adversary is yourself. Can you keep your cool? Can you stay under control under a pressure, uh, 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 pressure situation? How do you comport yourself? Yeah. Right? In, in front of your peers. All right. How... Do you strive through your training to become a better person? That's the real duel with yourself. And it never stops. One of my Uh, favorite uh, stories about uh, people falling into duels is about Aldo Nadi in his famous duel in Italy. Oh, yeah. That was was against a a man named Miss Miss Adolfo Cortonea, I believe his name was. And Aldo Nadi was very young. And he, um, uh, I think Cortone was a was not a fencing master. Neither was Nadi at the time, by the way. But he was he was a champion fencer at the time. You can't take that away from him. Um, and they had that duel. There's photographs of it uh, that can be had. Uh, I think you can see them on the internet. And there's a, uh, in fact, in in Nadi's own book on uh, on fencing, uh, you can see a, a photograph of, uh, of, of that was taken during that duel. And that duel, nobody, to my knowledge, nobody won that duel. That duel got out of hand. Like I read several accounts of it. And according to Anadi's own admission, during the first pass, he got wounded. Yeah. So what, what does that tell you? Um, technically, Nadi lost that duel. Yeah, because it was a duel to first blood. An amateur. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, it was a duel to first I, blood, right? Uh, um, well, it su- was supposed to be, but it got a little out of hand. <laughs> I think there were several bloods on that duel. And, and, uh, and I think, knowing what I know about dueling, and thank God I've never been in one, and I don't, and I don't ever want to be in one, the seconds lost control of that situation, and they were completely irresponsible. Yeah. That's what I think. That should have been stopped in the first pass. Because yeah. apparently Nadi wounded that man several times in the chest. How he didn't kill him, I don't know. Yeah, it's, and so it's interesting to see a sword duel documented in the early 20th century. Well, you know, you can go on YouTube and you can, there's, there's, there's videos of several duels that took place. And uh, they're all amateurs, you know. Uh, if you're going to go there to look for pretty fencing, you're not going to find it. But in the same token, you're going to find fencing that is not reckless at all. Yeah. You know, uh, because they, they know the outcome of a, of, of, of a you know, of a fa- fatal mistake. It, uh, it's, it, it got real. It got real. And it, I, look, uh, uh, there was a famous uh, fencer and duelist. His name was the Baron de Bezancourt in the, in the 19th century. I always called him. He says, a sharp point is a preemptory fact that works, make, that, that makes short work of illusion. <laughs> so when you think you're all that, you're facing another person with a sharp weapon, you're looking right at him, you see hate in his eyes, and that person's bent on hurting you, all the other ideas of superiority come to a, just come crashing down. Yeah. And then it says, oh, oh, now this is it. Mm-hmm. How do I know that? I've never been in a duel, but I've talked to people who have. And yeah. they say that, listen, I said, it's as serious as a heart attack. And speaking of 
uh, clean and well done fencing, what does the path to becoming a fencing master look like? What does it look, what did you do? How do, what, how does one do that in the 21st century? It's not easy. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. My, I'll tell you my own experience. I never wanted to be a fencing master. It was the furthest thing from my mind. But somehow or another, it happened. But it took me 10 years of apprenticeship. And I had to prove myself, not just as a, a, a person that was knowledgeable about fencing, but a person that had to actually fence. You cannot be a, profess to be an instructor in swordsmanship unless you're a strong fencer. Now, right. I didn't say champion. That's a whole different matter because the champion is so, so uh, totally self-centered and it's about the game and the tournament and winning at, at, at a sport. You have to be a strong swordsman. You have to know your, your, your art and science and be able to impart that because learning how to fence is hard enough, but then learning how to teach fencing, that's even harder. Because every time you teach a class, you have to prove yourself to yourself whether or not you know what you're talking about. You know, uh, you cannot be unsure. You have to know. Like I've seen um, people teaching fencing and, they, and one of my biggest peeves and they, and, they, and they always go, makes sense? And they go like this to the person. Makes sense? Like they want you to agree with them. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're asking that question, makes sense like that? Are you, are you trying to convince yourself or it's good to go both? Because if you were a real master, a real instructor, you wouldn't ask that question. Hmm. Okay. The question we would ask is, can I clarify anything for you? That's the question. Or is there anything that I can, that, that you need to, uh, more, more information on? That's the way, but you don't, you don't do that. Uh, so anyway, T, uh, learning how to become a fencing master is very hard. It depends that each person has a different ability. You have to go through the process. You just can't hang a sign on your door and say fencing master because that is, that is in fact a, a, a ball based lie. Only you can only become a fencing master by being trained by a fencing master. I'll go even further. National institutions, sports organizations, they're not creating fencing masters. They're creating highly trained coaches and athletes. It's a whole different matter. Okay. So to be that, let's say if you if you train with me, you would have to tr you would have to learn every weapon that we teach in my academy. And that's a lot. Yeah. Every weapon, you have to be able to be a strong fencer in it. You have to be, first you have to become a weapon, in, and, and, excuse me, a, uh, an instructor in each weapon. Then from that, you become provost. From provost, then you, then you become master. It's a long process. And uh, to uh, get an idea of how arduous that training is, I'd rather not tell you. I'd rather you ask the people who be, have become instructors, provosts, and masters through me, and they will tell you much more clearly than I can. <laughs> and I am not easy on people. Yeah. And uh, having the, trained the, with the, you, the academy, you know. Yeah. Uh, having trained with you, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. So, you know, and um, another thing is this: is like you know, um, this is not me saying this. Masters have said this in the past. Uh, this says, you know, uh, diplomas and, you know, certificates of proficient, proficiency are no guarantees. The best way to, to, to see what the ability of, of a master is or an instructor, go see a class. Go talk to the person. Take a lesson. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And if you see that that person does the walk as well as the talk, that's the person you should train with. If he, doesn't, if he does the talk and doesn't do the walk, run for the door okay so you've been a fencing master for a number of years now has your yeah. your search for knowledge your training your personal training has that stopped absolutely not i'm always uh, doing uh, research all the time and I'm lucky because I can, I can read, read several languages. So I, can, I can read, you know, obviously Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, French, some French, and, uh, and English, obviously. But I'm always looking to improve. You know, I, 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 when I became a fencing master, I didn't just go cross my arms and I have arrived. No, this is just <laughs> the beginning. 
beginning, you know, uh, and uh, and I'm I'm constantly trying to improve what I do to make my uh, my teaching better because we're not automatons. Because you memorize something, you can do it by rote. That doesn't make you a teacher. That makes you a parrot. Yeah, you know, uh, anybody can do that. But to really study your art and live your art every day, I did. I practice every day. Yeah, uh, every day. I have I have uh, weapons all over all over my house. You've been here. And what I do is I have a, a, an empty room upstairs, and I go there and I do my lunges. I practice on the target. I do my footwork every day, along with with other um, uh, work that I do. I, I, besides fencing, like I saw before, I studied other martial arts like uh, kung fu and tai chi and stuff like that. I learned things from them that I do for my own personal. I don't teach that because I'm not I'm not accredited to teach that. But for my own teach my own work, I, I will use stuff like. Uh, um, yoga and qigong and things like that to uh, to uh, to stay healthy and uh you don't have to practice for a long time but you have to practice at least every day or try to practice every day a little bit doesn't take a lot but yeah. you have to practice uh just like a pianist he has to he has to practice on that piano every day and it's the same with me you can't you know uh again i said i i I'm getting older now, so you know, I have to be most, I, in fact, I have to develop my skill even more now because as you get older, your muscular strength and, and, and reflexes do diminish, that, but, but that gives me a signal. That means I have to prove my technique and my form to the higher level than it was before, so it never stops, so I can be more efficient. And this is uh, not only a very good way to continually work on your own skills, it's a great way to stay sane during the, the quarantine and the shelter in place. Oh, believe me, I've, we've been cooped up in here you know, for months now, since March. And if I didn't have that, you know, I, I, think, I think I would have you know, got up on the roof and started screaming. <laughs> but uh, uh, I have uh, my, my, my physical practice. I'm doing my research. I do writing. You know, uh, there's a lot of writing projects that I'm working on. Uh, and, and, and there's always there's always a uh, room for improvement. That's uh, basically, it. but getting back to the original question about the, what's the difference between classical and modern? Modern fencing is is a sport. It's a game. Yeah. And now, is it a game to be taken lightly? No. You uh, to be a modern fencer, you have to be a top notch athlete, and you have to be very skilled at what you do. But that is not a martial art because uh, uh, the simple reason that the, because it's a game you can afford to take risks that no sane swordsman would take with a sharp weapon. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's the difference. In, in a nutshell, uh, it's, it's really not that complex. Now, do, do, do I have contempt for modern friendships? Absolutely not. That's, that's what they do. It's not what I do. And, it, I, and I, I know that because I've been in both worlds. One of my favorite sayings is from the great tactician, Mike Tyson. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the nose. Yeah. I, I remember hearing him, him say, my father was a boxer. And I asked him, what's the best way to learn how to box? And he says, you know what you do? You get in the ring and you get punched in the face. Because <laughs> it's going to happen. And you're going to make sure that that never happens again. Either you're going to learn how to box or you're going to leave the ring forever. Yeah. You are involved with an organization. You were on the board of directors for uh, an organization called the Association for Historical Fencing. What is mm -hmm. that? The Association of Historical Fencing is an, is, is an organization that is there to disseminate factual information about fencing historically um, and to provide, to, to, to provide an, an, an education in that. Because uh, there's a lot of speculative thought out there. The, the, the AHF only puts down uh, or works with facts, historical data, and puts it out there. Yes, there's articles and events that we do. We have, we have tournaments uh, throughout the year. I say we, I'm no longer a part of the board, but I would say we, because I was one of the founders. Uh, and and that, that's the, the, the main focus of the, of, uh, the AHF, is to provide factual, historical, and technical information about the art and science of fencing. Okay, very cool. And that includes historical battles and building anecdotes and the study of weapons. And uh, uh, it's basically haplology. You know, uh, it's, it's about that. People write articles and 
collectors, uh, you know, they, they, sometimes they show their weapons and they, but that's all about factual information. And we, we, what we, we want to do is provide an educational service that is not speculative, but is in fact based on sound fact. Yeah. You've worked with a gentleman called Anthony DeLongis on creating some videos that have helped introduce people to the art of fencing. What have you found are some of the challenges in our teaching fencing in a video format? Yes, Anthony DeLongas is a, is a good friend of mine here. We met at, at the first uh, seminar that I taught on, on, on the Spanish school. We met in, in Oregon, as a matter of fact. And uh, he, was in, he, he was in that workshop and he came up to me and he says he liked the way I teach I taught so much that he says, you and I have to work together. And uh, I remember him walking up to me. He says, hi, my, I'm, I'm Anthony DeLongas. And he said, I said, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm actually a fan of yours. <laughs> I, 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 like, I, I liked him in the movies that he's done. Yeah. So we, be, we became friends after that. And then he, uh, he actually produced uh, the, uh, the first videos that we did. We did the Spanish, uh, the Stresa videos. And then we did the Italian ones. And then we did the French one. The French ones, I think, in, to my, in my opinion, are the best ones because it's, it's a three, three disc set and it was it's very in-depth. Now, the, the challenges of teaching on video, it is extremely challenging because you cannot put down everything in, in, in video. At best, what the videos could do is give, you, give the person uh, looking at them is guidance in the way to train. You can't learn a martial art from a video. You can't learn a martial art from a book. Those are, those are teaching aids. Like, the, the, uh, like my, my Spanish videos. Those videos were, were designed to, to show people how to prepare to then begin training. All right. All right. They're not in depth. All right. And I got a little bit more in depth in my third one, which we produced ourselves. That one's a little better. But even in that one, it's, it's, it's limited because I can't be there to guide the person through. For instance, in the, uh, in the, in the first set of videos, what I did was uh, I tried to make the approach to, to, to the Spanish school as simple as possible. Now, and I, I, even, I even did not use all of the Spanish terminology. I, I used a terminology that already exists, and anybody who knows something about fencing should be able to understand the terminology that, that I uh, use in English, right? Uh, it makes no sense for me to stand up there and teach in Spanish when the idea was to present the Spanish school to the English-speaking world. Right. Maybe in the future I'll do some in Spanish, but I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know. Maybe for, for right now, my focus is to it, it, it to uh, it, it's always been to bring to this, the Spanish school to the English speaking world. So I used uh, different terminology, and I used uh, uh, visual aids like we have the uh, Tebow circle on the floor. That we that we train on. Are we actually using that circle? No, we, we, we use that circle as a space reference. So instead of using it as just a plain floor, so people have an, an idea if they slow if, if they look at the at, at the at the video context where our feet are, where our blades are, but we're not following T Bow's way. Uh, so that those videos were an introduction. And I and I and I, again, I, and I, did I teach it exactly the way they uh, uh, the Spanish masters taught <coughs> back in the day? Well, first of all, I could, my answer to that no, because we, they didn't have videotapes back then. Yeah. Right. As far as my uh, how I, how that is being presented, I use my own didactic way, my own pedagogical approach to the Spanish school. That's not necessarily this is not necessarily the same as what we've done historically. My goal was that is to introduce people to the Spanish school. All right. Okay. And um, there's other stuff that I can get into, but it would take me a long, I would have to do a video on that alone to, you know, <laughs> to explain my, 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 uh, my teaching method, my pedagogical approach. But in the same way, you know, I'm a professional. 
I'm, I'm a, a methodist, and I don't have to justify how I teach to anyone. I do right. what I do. People ask me, so what system do you teach? And I said, that's very simple. That's I teach Martinez system because I'm Martinez. I'm not Carranza, I'm not Navarez. It's very simple. Uh, the books are there, and I did use the books to, to reconstruct. I, I'm still working on it. It's not finished. It'll probably never be finished in my lifetime. I'm always looking to improve. So the books are there as a teaching aid. But you, those books will not do you any good unless you already know how to fence. And what I mean to fence, I mean how to really fence, not you know, how people do that. There's a lot of dabblers out yeah. there that, you know, or, or not, dabblers is not a good word, uh, dilettantes. And that's fine. But I, I, I'm a professional and this, this is what I do. And I, and I took a, 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 a specific approach to doing that, to introduce the world to that. And, and really, uh, the Spanish school was very, very, you know, when I first started doing that, it was like 20, almost 20 years ago. The Spanish school was not really followed. Now, you see, you have Spanish fencers all over, all over the place. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say about that. But uh, the Spanish school, I, c c without seeming arrogant or self-modesty, I can tell you that I brought more e attention to La Verdadera Destresa than any master had in 150 years. Very and I can, cool. I, to my knowledge, I've been doing it longer than anybody else in the world. Very Take cool. that for what it's worth. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, it's, it's very difficult to, to teach on, 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 on teach video. The same thing with the Italian school. You can only present. Now, those things are there to aid you in your training. You cannot learn without a teacher. Having worked on those instructional videos, have that brings up another question for me. Have you worked mm -hmm. on other production video or stage or things like that? Uh, I have, but I, 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 don't, I don't think I want to talk about that. I know, I've done some, I, I, I came back to acting back in 2015, and I was in uh, one movie and I did a cameo appearance in another movie. And then I was a, uh, an off, off, off Broadway production of, of Shakespeare play, but I, I really don't want to talk about that. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Uh, so I'm keep that world separate. <laughs> is fencing relevant to today's world, and can do you think it can help prepare people for the challenges of the twenty first century? Oh yeah, I think it's, I think it's more. You know, I used to think I was misplaced in time, and I've come to figure out that. Uh, I am pre placed in time precisely where I should be because uh, fencing, classical fencing, historical fencing, traditional fencing, it's not so much about the technique. It's about developing yourself as a person who is uh, poised, confident, self-assured. Um, I, I don't want to say fearless because somebody tells you they're fearless. It's not true. Everybody has fears. It's how you deal with them. Right, right. It, it, it helps you. It helps you be, become a very stable person, because if you, because in martial arts, fencing or other words, you are learn. You are facing your greatest adversary. You're facing yourself, and the the biggest thing that you have to learn is self control. Self control of mind, body, spirit. Because how can you possibly hope to control another person or a situation unless you can control yourself first? So I tell my fencers all the time, do not react, enact something. Because if you react, you're not in control. If you enact something, you are totally in control. Yeah. Very like cool. Said, well, I should, if people ask me, should I react this way? Should I react this way, that way? I said, no, don't react at all. Enact, decide what you're gonna do and do it. Because, you know, uh, and it's, if you say, hey, uh, well, I, I have to get my reflexes and it's all about reflex, no. You don't, your, your body doesn't control you, you control it. So everything that I teach my, my students all the time, every single thing that you do, you have to use conscious thought. It's directed with what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you're visualizing, right? If you just react on something, that's no good. Now, suppose you're in a fight with sharp weapons and you react the wrong way and you get killed. How did, the, how, how, how did that work for you? Reactions were no good. Or people say, I have to be fast. I'm reactional. Fast can get you killed. Yeah. You can be too fast for your own good. 
just the same way as you can be too slow for your own good. So you have to, you, uh, fencing will teach you how to be decisive. When once you take, you, you decide to do something, you take immediate action, you don't ponder it. My fencing master used to say to us all the time, he who hesitates is lost. If you see something, if you're fencing with, with someone, act on it, do it, right? Either it'll work or not, but you've made a decision. I can tell you that fencing saved my life on several occasions. It helped me, helped me to get through things. I've, I've, I've gone through illnesses. If it wasn't for the discipline that I, the, the um, uh, mental, spiritual discipline that I learned from fencing and, and, and other martial arts, uh, I, I don't know what would have happened. I, I know that physically, uh, doctors have examined me and they have told me that, that I have uh, in, incredible bounce back powers and I could attribute that all to fencing and martial arts. So fencing is, is more relevant today. Now, if it's, if it's, if it's practiced, it's taught and practiced correctly, if, if you know, if people want to push their bodies beyond their limits, that's how you get injuries to your joints and, and, and muscle pulls and stuff like that because they're, they're asking their body to do more than it can. Now, does that mean that it can't be improved with training? Of course it can be improved with training. But then again, how much time do you want to devote? Right. The fencing was, was the, 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 throughout the history of fencing, fencing was not designed to be for, for athletes only, everyday people. Had to had to learn this martial art because if it's a martial art in science and it only applies to people who are strong, young, and fast, then it's useless because you have to apply that science to you in the state where you are today. Now, as I can say for myself, do I fence today the same way I did when I was at nineteen? No, I know better now. I know how to conserve energy. So, you know, that, and then that's with any martial art. You know, I'm using fencing because that's what I do. But you have to train correctly. If you have to go through a process of training to train, something went wrong. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I've met people, I've met martial arts. Oh, I have to go to a yoga class so I can do kendo better. What, what, what happened to the training kendo? <laughs> right? Or I have to, I have to go to, a, to a, a, a Pilates class so that I can be a better, you know, uh, Cut out the person. Or yeah, so. Something went wrong somewhere. Because if you're training in a martial art, it has to be complete. It has to have mind, body, spirit. It's supposed to nurture you, not harm you. Yeah. I like See? to tell all my guys, the, you can break the secret of martial arts down to one very simple rule. Don't hurt yourself. And it doesn't matter what the martial art is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the story of this guy who was practicing fast draw and he was so fast that he shot himself in the foot. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I know you know about that kind of stuff because you, you've, you've I done do. that. I... Not, you didn't shoot yourself in the foot, but you've done that the, the quick draw stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've taught all over the world. Mm -hmm. What's one of the most memorable places that you've taught? Oh, gee, this, I, I think really every place that I've taught is memorable because everything has to unique. But uh, my favorite place out of all the places I've been to, is Sicily. Okay. Sicily, the people were wonderful, friendly, the people that would go out of their way to help you out. Uh, I, although I do speak Italian, not great, but sufficiently. Their dialect is extremely difficult to, uh, to understand, but I spoke to them in broken Italian and Spanish, so we, uh, it, was, it was very good. I think the climate was wonderful. Uh, and I would say that the food and, and the wine was the best in Europe I've ever had. Nice. And we went, we went down there to do a, a, a workshop, a, a week-long workshop on Italian fencing. We covered everything from uh, rapier to dueling sword to saber and fort and Italian, everything Italian. But we also went to visit a small town called Cartagirone. Cartagirone is where one of our fencing ancestors came from, Aurelio Greco. Uh, the Italian fencing that we learned, uh, 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 a lot of it can be attributed to him as of, of the Southern of, of the Sicilian School of Fencing, but we also learned, have learned the, uh, the Northern style, the Northern system, sorry, I can contradict my, the Northern system, which can be traced back to Radeli, to, to Barbara City, they can be tra traced back to Radeli. We have two branches of Italian fencing. The Southern can be tra traced to uh, Greco, Aurelio Greco, 
taught my fencing master some uh, some fencing, and, and we still have those uh, uh, those those systems when we we, we teach them. And uh, that information again is available on our on our website on uh, online. But we went there, and there was a museum. Well, they had all the uh, memorabilia from Aurelio Greco and uh, his older brother, Jesse La Greco. And they, we went in there, and they were astonished that all these fences would come thousands of miles from New York City just to come and see that. And they said, that's why we're here. Yeah. And they were so generous that they let us, uh, they took us into the museum. They took everything out of storage and out of the cases and let us handle the weapons and everything. And, and they were so wonderful, they didn't want us to leave. So out of all the places in Europe that I've been to around the world, I would say that is uh, the, 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 my most memorable one, my favorite one, because <laughs> anyway, as I was leaving, uh, they said, in, 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 they asked me, they said, where are you going? I said, well, I have to leave. I have to go back to New York for success. They go, no, no, you can't go. You have to stay here. <laughs> I said, well, I wish I could. But and they were very nice to us. They said, um, you can come back here anytime you, we consider you guys family. So that's, that's wow. when the Sicilian tells you that, that's a, that's a big deal. Yeah, it sounds like a great trip. So that was a great trip. And again, uh, everything, it was, it was wonderful. You, now, Spain was good too. France was good too. Several other places were good. They're all good. But this was the one that really stuck with me. Um, I can move and live there because, you know, the culture there, I like it very much. Nice, nice. You not only have a passion for historical fencing, but you're also fascinated by the tales of the American West. Oh, you yeah. You were talking about quick draw just a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. What draws you to that time period? Well, it all started when I was a, a small child. I, I think I was two or three years old. I, I remember my father taking me to my first movie. All right. And I remember it was the Ace Theater on Southern Boulevard in the Bronx. On a, on a Sunday afternoon, he took me there, and the first movie I ever saw was a movie called Jesse James. Yeah. And uh, I, I didn't know who the actors were at that time, but it was, uh, uh, it was re-released. And it was a 1939 movie with Tyrone Power and Henry Fonda in the, in the, as, as, as Jesse and Frank James. And I was watching that movie, and it's all in color, and I'm like fascinated, right? And it's, was, this is a whole new thing for me. And I remember seeing a scene where they rode their horses off a cliff. <laughs> yeah. And as, a, and, the, and as a little kid, I turned to my father and said, I, said, I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> he says, ride the horse off a cliff. I went, yeah, I want to do that. He says, we'll talk about that another time. But that's how I first got hooked on Westerns. And growing up as a kid in the 60s, there was Westerns in all the TV channels. It was, that was like Western, 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 Westerns. And one of my favorites was the Lone Ranger, of course. Every kid liked the Lone Ranger. Yeah. So I, I, I liked the idea of riding horses and shooting guns and stuff like that and uh, uh, getting the bad guys. And uh, as, as I got older, you know, uh, I still uh, love Westerns. Then I got, I got hooked on Spaghetti Westerns with the whole Clint Beastwood man with no name and stuff like that. And then I started actually doing research on the Old West. And I find that the historical uh, uh, accounts are much more fascinating than anything Hollywood can make up. I think, and I'm saying to myself, why can't Hollywood just use what's happened? <laughs> this is much better than the stuff they make up. You know, uh, things like Nobody that. Nobody would and, believe history. Yeah. It's like, uh, I remember when I was a kid seeing a, a, a movie about Wyatt Earp called My Darling Clementine with... Uh, Henry Fonda is Wyatt Earp, and they had the gunfight at the OK Corral, which they actually did in a corral. And then years later, I find out they didn't do it in the OK Corral. They did it in a vacant lot near the OK Corral. And I find now that the most accurate portrayal of that fight was, in fact, uh, Tombstone. Yeah. Because nice. I read the accounts. I read the, new new, the newspaper accounts, and I, I read the, uh, what, what Wyatt Earp wrote, his, his, his version with the map and the whole thing. I read all that. But... It, uh, it's it's fascinating to me, and uh, different characters like uh, Bat Masterson. He he uh, he was in the old west, not not his whole life. You know, he, he he moved to New York and became a sports writer here in New York for for a newspaper. And he actually died at his desk. He's buried up in the Bronx somewhere. Mm -hmm. So this is all really fascinating stuff. And then what happened was in when I met Anthony DeLongas, uh 
we started talking about that and he started talking to me that he does shooting and stuff like that and he belongs to the uh i forget what's called the single action shooting sas single action yes. shooting society and he told me about it and i said that's fascinating i never heard of that so he says uh because i said i never i never shot a gun he goes you never shot a gun so he looked at me and me and Janet said get in the car <laughs> <laughs> So he took us out to a range and he taught me how to shoot uh, the, first, the first time. And then we came back, back again to, to, uh, to, to do the filming of the, uh, the DVDs. He's out again and he's created a monster. I can't get enough of that stuff. Yeah. Now, living here in New Jersey, the, the gun laws are so draconian and I can't, I can't shoot. The only, the only time I ever get a chance to shoot is if, I, if somebody takes me to a range or I go visit Anthony at his ranch, and he teaches me stuff. So uh, uh, I learned anything I've ever learned about shooting. I learned from him. So he's not only my friend; he's my teacher as well. Nice. Uh, and uh, he's taught me. Uh, he started teaching me how to ride a horse, but I didn't have enough time to spend at the ranch to be, to become a good rider. So, but uh, I I trained uh, with, an, with another student of mine who is a uh, he was the, I think he's the world champion in cutting. So I've trained with him for a while, on and off, and I've learned, my, my skills have improved and know the level that I wanted to because I, I can't do this all the time. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm an old West fiend, you know. Yeah. Um, most of the time, you see me in winter, I dress, I dress like a cowboy anyway. I have my, 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 uh, my jeans and my cowboy boots and my cowboy hat. Uh, you would never know I was a fencing master. You, you would think I was a farm worker the way I look. <laughs> so there's a little something that most, a lot of people don't know about Maestro Martinez. Yeah. Uh, if somebody wanted to get involved in historical fencing or classical fencing, what would be your suggestion to help them get started? Well, that is a, it, that is a, a, a loaded question and a very difficult question to answer. To learn any martial art, you have to find a professional teacher, not a, not a, not a, uh, a dilettante, or someone who who does this as a hobby. You, you have to you have to find someone who does this for a living, like like you. You you know you know that you do this at, for a living. I have no hesitation in sending a student to you because this is what you do. You, you do this twenty four seven, and you study this and you work at it. You're always improving to become a teacher, and you know what you're talking about. I was. I had no hesitation teaching some, sending someone to you. That's a big today, honor. Today, today, people, uh, there are no, there are very few masters like me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a traditional master, master, master of arms. I, I, I teach. Uh, I'm a master of classical fencing, uh, slash traditional fencing, his, historical fencing. How did I learn? to become that man. I learned historical fencing from my master. I learned the system of rapier and dagger. I learned small sword technique. I learned knife technique. I learned poignard technique. And he taught me a collection uh, of, not a, not a system, but a collection of, of, of techniques for medieval weapons. That I only teach if people ask me, because I, 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 I'm very clear on this. I don't teach a system. I teach what I learned. And I learned in English, not in German, because that was our common language. He didn't speak Spanish as, as that well, and I didn't speak any German, so he taught me in English. Yeah. Okay, so keeping that aside, you have to be a discerning person. This is saying in, in Latin, caveat emptor, buyer beware. You have to find a competent teacher. Hard to find. You cannot, I repeat this again, you cannot learn any martial art, fencing or otherwise, from studying a book and practicing what is on the book on your own or trying to decipher that with your friends. You need a guide. For everything you, you have done in life, you needed someone to teach you. Your mother had to show you how to tie your shoes. Yeah. Your mother had to teach you how to, how to feed yourself, how to dress yourself. When you go to school, your teacher taught you how to write. All right? Me, I, I, I wanted to learn how to ride a horse, right? So I didn't, I didn't just get jump on the horse. I would be foolhardy. Right? I, I, I found someone that can teach me, somebody competent. That's hard to find. 
Today, people say, well, there's not enough fencing masters out there. Or people say, there are no fencing masters. I say, well, I said, if, that, if that's what you think, you're not looking hard enough because there are fencing masters out there. I'm one of them. I'm not a figment of your imagination, <laughs> right? And the people that I've trained to become masters, they're not figments of your imagination. Now, to learn to fence, you have to be, have to have the teacher to learn how, any martial art. For instance, people say, well, you can learn it, you can learn from a book. I said, really? Suppose I hand you a book on Tai Chi, you learn from that book, I'll give you a year's time, and then I can take you to a Tai Chi master here in New York and see what happens to you. Yeah. If you want to put your, 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 your self-taught ability against them, it's, you're going to be in for a very rude awakening. All right? So to learn that, so that's again, you need a teacher. A lot of people, people say, well, there's not a teacher near me. There are no teachers around here, so I have, to, I have to learn from the book and teach myself. Well, that could be true. But there's that old saying, if you can't bring Muhammad to the mountain, you bring the mountain to Muhammad, right? Yeah. So right. if you know that there is a competent teacher, a competent master somewhere, you can bring that person to you if you have enough people to get together and find a venue and create an event to bring that teacher over. This is nothing new. The founder of Akido did that all over Japan. He had, he had people and he travels from one place to another, from one place to another in the world. He didn't teach there all the time, but he had people that would bring him over there and he would teach these, these seminars. I knew a Japanese uh, 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 master of, of, of Kenjitsu who came to, the, to New York and he would come every once in a while. He was on tour and he would come and he would, and he, they had black folks here in New York that they would continue his teaching when he's gone. And uh, so that's what you do. If you don't have a teacher in you, a, a, a good one, then bring one. Okay. Right? If, you, if, if you can travel to where there's a good teacher, if you really want to do it, you, you'll, you'll make the time to come and train. You did. Yeah, that's... Plenty of my sister, plenty of my, uh, my, my protégés did. Maestro Longino, Maestro Blair, Maestro Kirby moved to New York to train with me. So if you want to do it bad enough, you can't do it. You'll find Saying that there's no teacher is not an excuse. Saying That's that a great only, answer. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, 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 you, if, it's like in my, in my school, and certain words I, 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 I don't allow. Yeah, yeah, but what if I can't? Those words are not allowed on my floor. Yeah, it's I, yes, they will, uh, they're, they're almost like excuses. Yeah, you know, it's, Yeah, that's so. That's, 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 you know, like, uh, people have brought me to different places in the world because they wanted to learn. Yeah, that's why you know I've, I've traveled to to Europe. I've traveled to Canada, uh, across the country, uh, to teach because people wanted it bad enough. And they, so they said, "Well, Maestro, can we can we hire you and to, to come and teach?" I said, "Yeah, say what? If, if I'm available, I'd be more than happy to go." Fantastic. So, and again, you have to see who you're dealing with. If you, 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 have to, you have to really develop an eye. Is the teacher that you're going to interested in tournaments and winning medals? I'll let you be the judge of that. If you have a teacher that is interested in imparting an, an, uh, a tradition that, is, that can go back a couple of centuries, that's another matter. If you go to work with a person who maybe he's not a professional teacher but he's sincere and he really wants to do things right and he wants to get together for maybe a club or something that's another thing there's, there's many options out there so there is no excuse for attaching yourself to a to a book and my final thought, thought on that is i'll give you some food for thought a book doesn't know you a book can't see you a book can't touch you a book can't correct you a book can't advise you yeah. The book never knows you. There you go. And fencing is all about getting to know yourself. Absolutely. You have no guide. Yep. Well, that was a great answer. Um, yep. It's been a great time. I've really enjoyed talking with you, listening to you. It's always a pleasure to get together with you. Uh, but I do have one last question for you. And I would like to oh. ask, ask this question of people that I've known for a while. and. 
what is a memory that you have of some time that we've spent together? Oh, that's easy. I remember when you, you and, and, and Susan came here for Jared's wedding. That and was a we great went time. upstate. We, we we drove upstate, and then we we went to eat something, and then we were antiquing. That was a lot of fun. We talked about a lot of stuff, and we looked a lot of that. That that was time well spent, I thought. And and uh, I think you stayed with me here. Yes, we we stayed at your house. Yeah. Having you here at my in my home, that was a lot of fun. You know, it was like basically. You, I don't know if you realize that or not. You've been adopted. <laughs> you and Susan have been adopted. <laughs> it's it's kind of we feel the same way you guys are our family as well yeah. anybody that stays at our house or that we stay at their house we generally end up we're family and i have to tell is... you my memory uh -huh. that always sticks out with you when at rapier camp i spent a week working on Miento. <laughs> a week all i wanted to do was be able to say that word to you and for a week, I kept mumbling it to myself during the, the rapier classes. Until the <laughs> final day, I was able to go up to you and say, I learned Akometi Minto. Yeah. <laughs> I got to tell you, you had me laughing all week until you finally got it. Now you, now you say, like, well, no problem. <laughs> for so many great speaker, times. That's a, that's a difficult word to learn. It's always a pleasure to see you, sir. Same here. And so we, can, we, we, need, we need to talk more and more. Because we're like our busy schedule, sometimes we, we have to make it so that we cross paths more. I agree. I, all right, sir. Well, thank you so very much for spending the time with me. All right. Take all care the best to and you and Jeanette. And have a wonderful day. Stay safe. And stay, stay safe as healthy. sane as you can. Yeah, try, try not to climb the walls too much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. Take care. Take care, Steve. Hey, guys. I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. It's always great to hear what somebody with his level of experience and knowledge has to say. If you like this video, please hit the subscribe button below. Subscribe to our channel. There's a lot of different types of videos on this channel. We have the whole series of pandemic interviews, as well as instructional videos for sword fighting. Thanks again for watching. Remember guys, stay safe, stay sane, and we'll get through this.